I'm Polly Gardner, and I'm the Continuing Education Coordinator for CQ, and your guide for today. Um, here's the plan. We're going to do some introductions and some reminders, including that this uh, session is being recorded. We'll have a 45 minute presentation and then we'll have a good 30 minutes or so for a question and answer and a discussion. So a couple of instructions. Yes, the session is being recorded and I know Tenzin has turned it on. Thank you so much. If you haven't uh, already done so, please mute yourself. Um, although I'm very interested in what you're having for lunch today, we like to keep that on the down low um, as it can be distracting. So please mute yourself. Um, just to note that we won't be monitoring the chat during the presentation, but feel free to use that function if you want. Um, we will use it afterwards, however, to gather questions. And also we'll use the hand raising tool um, during the question and answer and discussion, which was going to take place right after the talk today. So now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for today, Dr. Tegan Kalaki, who last year received the honorable mention for the Joan Eakin Award for Methodological Excellence in a Qualitative um, Doctoral Dissertation. About Tegan's dissertation, the awards committee made the following comments. Dr. Kalaki's dissertation is a highly original exploration of advanced care planning among patients experiencing heart failure using a framework, feminist ethical theory and relational autonomy, which he created using a combination of feminist philosophers critical theorists, and case study methodologists, something that the committee felt was super creative and sophisticated. The dissertation they summarized was a, ref a refreshing application of theory in cardiovascular research and points to opportunities to enhance individual agency in the face of existing constraint. I was going to say one of the best parts, but I think it is actually the best part of my work as coordinator for the CQ public seminar series is spending some one-on-one -on -one time with the presenters. And my conversation with Tegan was among one of my favorites. Her work is insightful and important. And as you'll hear today, she is razor smart and generously humble, which is just a beautiful combination and I think a perfect fit for this series, which is meant to inspire, but not overwhelm. Welcome, Tegan. Thank you so much, Polly, for that amazing introduction. I'm shaking a little bit, I was not expected. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. I'm just gonna share my slides. Give me one second. Okay. You're good. We can hear you and awesome. see them. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm thrilled to be here talking about case study research. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Um, and as a longtime CQ student myself, I'm um, really happy to be here sharing my work with you and hoping that we can have a, a great conversation today. So looking forward to all of your, your thoughts as well. I did wanna just take a quick moment to acknowledge the land that we are privileged to work and live on, um, especially in honor of last week's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, this is just a picture of my family enjoying the fall colors in Muskoka. And I wanted to take the time to acknowledge how grateful I am to not only work, but also learn on this land. So the objectives for today, just like Polly mentioned, I'm hoping to inspire, but not overwhelm. So I wanted to kind of get everyone on the same page about case study, give a little bit of uh, background and definitions and overview of the methodology, and then talk a little bit about the need for and development of a critical qualitative case study approach that I use. And I'll be primarily using the example of my uh, doctoral research as uh, an example of 
how this kind of methodology can be a theory-based approach to studying uh, various social phenomena. And I'm hoping by the end, I'll convince you that you can use a case study approach for your next research project as well. Um, so case study research has a long history within the natural and social sciences and humanities dating back to the early 1920s. It was originally seen as a useful way for researchers to make inferences or understanding events outside of the laboratory, but in a way that was consistent with the rigorous practices of investigation inside a lab. Over time, case study really built interest across multiple disciplines as researchers wanted to study phenomena in context. However, despite really widespread use in various disciplines and fields, case study research has received relatively little attention um, in the literature on research strategies. And this is definitely true in terms of qualitative case study uh, in particular. And uh, just a, a pitch for the case study, Encyclopedia of Case Study Research here. If anyone is interested, I would encourage you to check it out. It's an overview of any concepts related to case study that you could ever need. There are a number of definitions of case study research. And so I'm hoping to just kind of highlight some of the key elements for you here. The focus of case study is really um, an investigation of a single or collective case intended to capture the complexity of an object of study. And the definition I really like from, from Yin is an empirical inquiry that investigates a contemporary phenomena in depth and within real life settings. And I think that focus on real life settings and social context is especially key. Um, the goal is really to intensively study a relatively bounded phenomenon. Um, and in qualitative case study research in particular, draws together a variety of methods. Um, and this is what State calls a palette of methods, which I really like. Um, and overall, case study is really defined by an interest in the individual cases rather than the methods of inquiry used. So this really allows the researcher to tailor the research approach to best explore the study phenomena. So there are two kind of main authors or perspectives on case study that you will likely come across if you're being introduced to case study research. And they're kind of often juxtaposed in the literature um, as kind of the two key uh, readings, methodological readings in this work. So the first is Yin, um, and Yin comes from a post-positivist perspective and can be really helpful in outlining and defining case study as a methodology, um, providing some guidelines about design and data collection techniques and um, kind of specific process related um, points, which can be really beneficial. A lot of the kind of key methodological writing about case study research does adopt a post-positivist perspective really seeing that the truth is something that can be accessed through applying prescriptive and rigid research techniques and there is kind of one singular truth to be um, explored and uh, reported upon and I think that can be really off-putting for researchers that might be coming from different perspectives um, and so just to to kind of highlight that that's one that's one kind of author but there are other approaches um, and we'll talk more about um, the benefits of kind of taking pieces of each of these approaches. The other kind of key author to be aware of is Stake. And Stake comes from the social constructivist paradigm, really providing more of the interpretivist perspective on case study and uh, gives insight into con contextualization of cases, case selection and triangulation. Um, and importantly, the ability of case study to contribute to and refine theory and ultimately is concerned with understanding relationships, complexities, and problems within a case. So just kind of wanted to introduce you to those two kind of key authors in the field. There are others, of course, who are really relevant as well, which we'll bring up. So case study as a methodology, experienced qualitative researchers have identified that case study research is a standalone qualitative approach. It really transcends the boundaries of tra traditional research paradigms and can be approached in different ways depending on the epistemological standpoint of the researcher. So it can be appropriate actually to draw on more than one approach, especially in the context of conducting health services research. Um, and so this is kind of one of the, the points that I'll continue to get at throughout the talk. Um, but it's really uh, an essential research methodology for applied disciplines and can be thought of also as a research strategy, which is also a term I like. 
um, that attempts to examine contemporary phenomenon and their associated contexts that are not clearly evident. I think the most important point that again, I'll kind of touch on throughout this presentation is that the tenets of case study methodology strongly support employing a previously developed and established philosophical framework to guide the research process. Um, and, and this is something that um, is really beneficial about employing case study as an approach. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the types of case studies, um, but just kind of run through these pretty quickly. So intrinsic case study is typically uh, looked at to learn about a unique phenomenon and uh, understanding what distinguishes this unique phenomenon from all others and to understand the particulars of a single case. An instrumental case study uses a case to gain a broader appreciation of an issue and kind of provides insight on an issue and is used to refine theory. And then finally, collective case study involves multiple cases, uh, studying multiple cases simultaneously or sequentially to generate an even broader appreciation of a particular issue. This can really be understood as multiple instrumental cases um, being observed in unison or parallel or sequential order. And more than one case can be studied simultaneously. Um, but an important point is that each study is concentrated, a single inquiry that is studied holistically in its own entirety. I'll be focusing um, my talk today on the collective case study approach. Um, but one thing I did really wanna highlight is that a uh, good case study typically uh, reflects real life situations and represents both good and bad practices and failures as well as successes. So it really lends itself well to pragmatic health services research, which is something that I think we need now more than ever. Another key feature of case study research is um, delimiting and defining the case. So many authors have kind of suggested various ways to bind cases, making sure that uh, the research is feasible and to avoid having a research question that's too broad. Delimiting these boundaries uh, allows the researcher to highlight both what will and will not be studied, and also indicates the kind of breadth and depth of a qualitative study um, as well as helping to define the sample. And this is all kind of part of the methodological process of undertaking case study research. This process is kind of has different terms depending on which authors you're using. Uh, Yin calls this the unit of analysis um, or the case purpose dyad that is mediated by the theoretical framework. So case study research has a level of flexibility that is really not readily offered by other qualitative approaches. But this flexibility is kind of two sides of the same coin. It's a, it's a really exciting opportunity and it also um, can be a challenge. So current qualitative case studies are often shaped by paradigm study design, selection of methods. And so they can really vary um, and differences between published case studies can make it really difficult for researchers to define and understand um, what case study is as a methodology. This open nature can also be um, potentially off-putting to novice researchers because there really isn't a super prescriptive approach to uh, the research process. Um, and again, just to kind of come back to this point of the development of a well-informed theoretical framework um, is imperative in guiding case study research and not only for the process itself, but to um, support the rigor and trustworthiness of results. So as a novice researcher, I was reading about case study, I was learning about these key concepts like binding the case, but I was still wondering what this really looked like in practice when I was supposed to go out and do my study, um, especially when coming from a critical perspective. So I typed all my keywords into Google Scholar and I really couldn't find anything. Um, and this is where I have to give huge credit to my mentors uh, and my thesis supervisors, Dr. Sean Mohammed and Dr. Elizabeth Peter. Um, for their writing on using case study in post-structural research. Um, they really demonstrated how a post-structural application of case study methodology could highlight ways that power, knowledge, and discourse constitute a phenomenon. And this really shaped my thinking around critical case study and how it could facilitate the examination of multiple relationships among different types of participants from different social positions, different documents or observational data as well. 
and um, really to examine the nuanced way that people are able to resist power relationships. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about my research project itself to be able to bring some of these concepts to life and give some concrete examples about how we developed our critical case study approach um, and hopefully share some of our findings with you as well to bring this full circle and kind of demonstrate the types of findings that case study methodology can achieve. So as uh, Polly mentioned, um, I did focus my topic in heart failure. In terms of reflexivity, um, my background is in cardiac nursing. I've been a cardiac nurse for over 10 years and that was always my area of passion and interest and that was where I wanted to focus my work. Um, heart failure is a specifically um, chronic progressive and terminal illness and patients have really poor median survival rates. And what we're seeing is that as we're able to treat cardiovascular disease with increasing therapeutic innovation, more and more people are living on to develop heart failure as a result, and that's leading to it becoming an epidemic in Canada. Heart failure patients are extremely complex and have a very unpredictable disease trajectory, not only because of the illness itself, but because of the variety of therapies and technologies available throughout the course of their illness, things like implantable cardiac devices, non-invasive valves, ventricular assist devices, and transplantation. Heart failure is characterized by periods of stability and then periods of severe disease exacerbation, which leads to unplanned hospitalization, procedures, intensive care use, along with challenges prognosticating and anticipating the end of life phase. So this means that patients often end up dying in hospital after receiving intensive medical intervention, despite evidence that they may prefer to die at home or in the community with more supportive measures in place, which is that exactly what I was seeing and experiencing in practice and wanted to know more about. So because of all of this, advanced care planning is a healthcare practice that is recommended to take place proactively early and often for these patients. So another kind of key component of this study was advanced care planning which historically has been seen as a way for people to exert their individual autonomy by controlling life-sustaining treatment decisions beyond the time at which capacity was lost. So this was primarily achieved through documentation of advanced care directives, or uh, you might hear it called a living will. And in this model, autonomy is exerted at one discrete time point by one individual when they sign that document. And this is kind of conceptualized very similarly to the process of informed consent. More recently, our understanding of ACP has shifted to seeing it as a process that enables people to define their goals and preferences for future care, discuss these with family and healthcare providers with the goal of ensuring that people receive care that is congruent with their values, goals, and preferences during serious and chronic illness. However, this newer model assumes that personal values, wishes, beliefs, and goals are currently being incorporated into the decision-making and informed consent discussions throughout the illness trajectory. So of course, we started with a literature review. We found that the majority of heart failure patients don't participate in ACP, despite over 30 years of research, intervention, and awareness campaigns. The literature largely conceptualized patients as autonomous, rational individuals who are readily and easily able to access a set of stable desires and preferences, and then document and communicate these in a meaningful way for the healthcare team. But at the same time, we saw that patient preferences are extremely challenging to predict, and they also change frequently throughout the disease trajectory and into the end of life phase. The literature overall was largely positivistic. ACP was assumed to be an inherent good that people should participate in, and therefore interventions focused on individual level behavior change. And the research really lacked an analysis of broader institutional and social forces that influence this process. So what we realize is that although respect for individual autonomy is assumed to be the philosophical basis of ACP, it really fails to account for the prevalence and importance of relationships, not only at the end of life, but throughout the course of chronic disease management, which can be decades long for heart failure patients specifically. So one of the goals of this work was to provide a reconsideration of the practice of ACP based in feminist ethics, which puts forth a relational approach to autonomy as an alternative to the dominant individualized framework. Um, feminist ethical theory falls under the broader theoretical perspective of critical social theory, 
Um, and it was chosen for a variety of reasons, but especially because um, it lets us look at problems in different ways and it exposes existing assumptions about a practice like UCP. Critical theory also allows for the identification of aspects of social life or processes that can support the development of future interventions. Um, and importantly for this study, it supported the interpretation and assessment of a problem from an alternative moral perspective, which was exactly what we were trying to do. So just a little bit about feminist ethical theory. Um, as opposed to kind of mainstream ethical theory, which tends to focus on abstract principles like justice or autonomy and more masculine ideas of morality and individual rights and freedoms, feminist ethical theory focuses on morality as negotiations of responsibility within relationships. Um, there's a real interest in the existence and effects of power relationships extending beyond the healthcare system to um, broader social and global conditions that might perpetuate oppression um, and methodologically is really interested in capturing information about a uh, person's situated encounter with the healthcare system. So relational autonomy was really the key um, concept for my study. Um, and relational autonomy really emphasizes the socially embedded nature of people and recognizes that the ability to be self-directed is affected by broader social and political forces. It sees uh, autonomy as being shaped by relationships um, and individuals kind of construct their identities through relationships throughout their lives and that the self exists fundamentally in relation to others. And ultimately recognizes that social location determines the opportunities that are even available to people to support the development of various autonomy skills. So we developed three research questions that guided the study. We were interested in knowing more about how people understand ACP, how they express autonomy when participating in ACP, and how social location mediates participation in ACP. And again, you'll notice that these are all three questions that start with how, which are especially well suited to um, being explored with the case study methodology. Um, so I've already kind of reviewed the key uh, guiding theoretical framework of feminist ethics and our key concept of relational autonomy. Our, my other two kind of key concepts for social location, which of course consisting of kind of social identities, roles and relationships. And then uh, the other key concept was medicalization. And this in involves people viewing a problem, condition or life circumstance in medical terms, using medical concepts or discourses to describe normal life phenomena, such as birth or death and accepting the use of medical interventions as the most legitimate way to treat these conditions. So using relational autonomy really allowed me to think about autonomy in context and explore how patients were situated. And I really like to think about it by starting at the individual patient level or one single petal on a flower, which was the patient themselves dealing with their heart failure diagnosis and then moving outwards to the interpersonal level, which included their family and loved ones and other important relationships that made up their identity. Then thinking about the institutions that supported them, like the healthcare system, which delivered them nutrients of information or supported them throughout their illness. And finally, the social level, which I think of as the environment, like the soil and the sun um, and invisible social forces um, like wind or neoliberalism that shape the way that the flowers grow. So this approach was really key and then moving on to develop the case study methodology. And I use this understanding of autonomy to shape the way that I constructed the cases. So our approach um, is what I'm calling a critical qualitative multiple case study approach. And uh, it, we were guided by both Fake and Yin as well as other case study authors. Um, and as we know, we're looking to investigate a phenomenon in depth and in a real life setting. And so the phenomenon of interest in this case was the experience of advanced care planning. So cases were constructed starting at that individual level by recruiting the person with advanced heart failure. We then moved outwards to capture the interpersonal level of family members, healthcare providers, and others, and then examine the institutional and social level, which involved analyzing policies, legal documents, educational materials, et cetera. So the benefit of this approach is that it facilitates the examination of multiple relationships among different types of participants and different types of data. 
So you can see there were a variety of data collection techniques that we employed, um, primarily semi-structured interviews with participants, as well as some observation and field notes, and then a document analysis as well. So as I mentioned, one of the key components of case study research is binding the case. And because we were focused on this experience of advanced care planning, we really needed to be clear about what definition we were using and what would or would not be included um, in these case studies. So we purposely left our definition um, broad to gain insights into various aspects of the heart failure uh, treatment experience and decision-making at different stages of illness. So we weren't limiting uh, discussion, limited to discussions about end of life care specifically. Patients were making different decisions or working through different um, experiences depending on where they were at in their disease. We were also interested in how patients made important decisions about their lives in general. Um, and that was really helpful to get a better understanding of their sense of autonomy and how to juxtapose some of those experiences um, with their experiences in the healthcare setting. And so we ended up with this um, definition at the bottom, um, which is kind of a, a very well-known and well-cited current definition of advanced care planning that captures this broadness of being able to um, have people reflect on their values and goals, um, and then define some of their preferences for future, future treatment and be able to discuss those with family and healthcare providers. So developing a case study database is a method suggested by Yin um, to demonstrate the specific makeup of each case. And I think this is a really good example of where pulling a suggestion from a post-positivist a paradigm can still be useful even in a critical perspective, um, especially again as a novice researcher. Um, so I, I use this to kind of demonstrate the specific makeup of each case, the variety of participants and data sources, and the way that data was recruited and sampled. And this method also enhanced the rigor by providing an audit trail that allowed data to be identified and traced to the study. Um, and especially again, as a doctoral student having to um, report that back to my committee and, and have that transparency be part of our, um, our process as well. So I just wanted to provide a kind of high level overview of the case construction and highlight the specific components. So seven cases um, comprised of 24 participants, 19 interviews, 11 documents, and in total over 500 pages of data. I also wanted to use this database to highlight the specific social context relevant to each of the cases. And I think this is an example of where you can take that concept of a case study database um, and actually use it to your advantage as a critical researcher and helping to highlight um, the kind of breadth of cases that you're able to develop. And I wish I had time to share every participant's story in depth as they all had very unique experiences and illness trajectories, which in the end really demonstrated the complexity and heterogeneity of the heart failure population. But overall, you can see we had a large age range of variety of healthcare provider types and different documents. And this was one of the biggest strengths of the work because using this methodology allowed us to capture a very diverse data set and to provide a holistic understanding of the experience. So using case study analysis in conjunction with a critical feminist lens allowed power dynamics um, within social processes and relationships to be made visible. Um, as in the majority of qualitative research, our collection and analysis happen concurrently in an iterative fashion. Um, and using uh, relational autonomy as a theoretical perspective helps us to provide descriptive clarity to this complex experience as we were using both theory and empirical data in an iterative analytical fashion. Um, by incorporating some of the social, political, and historical context into the analytical process, I was also able to kind of connect the practical experience of ACT um, as a moral experience with more abstract theoretical proposals related to um, relational conceptions of autonomy. So uh, the kind of process was a within case and then cross case analysis. So I first considered each case as a whole on their own and constructed each case with the individual uh, patient and working outwards to include their relationships with family members and professionals. Um, and then the broader societal relationships were explored using the concept of social location. So once each case was constructed and analyzed, then a cross-case analysis followed 
where patterns or similarities as well as inconsistencies across the various cases were identified and explored. Um, so again, as opposed to searching to uncover one singular or central truth, my goal is to examine how autonomy is experienced relationally and how ACT may be approached differently based on patient social location. So I wanted to touch on triangulation because I think this is a key component of case study research and case study allows for the triangulation of multiple data points. Um, and this is where kind of pulling from both perspectives is really helpful. So this is where I really use stakes conceptualization of triangulation, which suggests that it allows for the championing of multiple perspectives and helps identify different realities rather than aiming to uncover one single truth. Um, coming from a critical perspective that views reality as mediated by power relationships and values and responsibilities, using triangulation in this way allowed for the privileging of multiple viewpoints and to get an in-depth understanding of power dynamics and various roles and responsibilities that influence a complex social process like ACT. Um, using triangulation in this way is also uh, a strategy to enhance the credibility of the study. And um, data from a variety of sources are kind of analyzed together to provide a holistic understanding um, and incorporate an exploration of relevant relationships, which is obviously key when we're thinking about relational autonomy. Um, and I really like this idea uh, from Baxter and Jack who say that the data, strands of data are braided together to promote a greater understanding of the case. Um, and so I triangulated data collection techniques through interviews, observation, and document analysis, and also triangulated sources by incorporating perspectives of patients, family members, healthcare providers to support the study's methodological rigor. So what, what the participants reported was not necessarily verified through triangulation, but allowed for a more nuanced and holistic understanding of the experience of ACT in heart failure, um, creating a web of perspectives versus trying to synthesize similar views. So I'm just gonna take you through some of the findings um, to help kind of demonstrate what this looks like um, in practice and what kind of the end result is of using this type of methodology. So we had three kind of key findings that came out of this work. The first was that ACT was a complex social process, which was often positioned outside of the standard treatment decision-making within the biomedical model. The second is that the agency of patients was constrained in advanced heart failure due to the limited understanding of complex information, limited treatment options, and the protocolized nature of decision-making. And finally, um, findings indicated that autonomy in ACP was shaped heavily by interpersonal relationships and responsibilities, as well as power dynamics and broad social forces. So I'll talk about each of these individually, um, but overall, the takeaway was that patients' experience of autonomy was incongruent with the dominant individualistic approach that is currently, currently used to structure ACP interventions and instead was a relational experience. So in regards to the first key finding, although many participants weren't familiar with the specific terminology of advanced care planning, which made our interviews very interesting, um, there were two types of future care decisions that people generally referenced. The first were heart failure treatment decisions, things like medications, devices, therapies that were driven by the healthcare team and were guided by overarching protocols, guidelines, candidacy criteria, which we can talk more about. So these decisions were framed by the biomedical model of decision-making and were seen as largely outside of the control of patients. Then there were personal decisions which revolved around after-death legalities related to finances, wills, burial arrangements, and these were guided by the legal model and were understood as things that participants did have control over. ACP was primarily seen as this type of personal process uh, related to finances, wills, and legal agreements. So as an example, um, when asked about her experience with ACP, Judy, who was a healthcare provider, immediately relayed her experience supporting her mother and aunt through the financial and funeral planning process. Judy wasn't the only healthcare professional who related ACP to personal experience. Many of the providers used examples to describe end of life decision making in their own families, as opposed to providing clear examples of their professional role in ACP or even their experiences integrating patient goals and values into treatment decision-making. 
taken together, this understanding reflects how ACT is seen as external to treatment decision making. Participants really connected ACT to aspects of life outside of the healthcare system and even outside of medical control, like prepaying for funeral expenses, which may have influenced their ability to approach and participate in ACT in the context of clinical relationships. When the legal and biomedical models of decision-making did overlap, the process of ACT was reduced to obtaining code status or determining resuscitation preferences. So for example, when discussing ACT with Andrea, who was a nurse and a director of care at assisted living facility, she noted that during her initial assessment, she asked what the resident's wishes are, but then in the next phrase immediately dictates this means they either sign for CPR or no CPR, and that's the extent of their decision-making. Many patients also initiated discussions of DNR with me during interviews, which were clear and were clearly familiar with the concept. The healthcare decisions that patients viewed as under their control related specifically to refusing resuscitation, but seemed to exclude decisions about the treatment plan leading up to the resuscitation point or any involvement in conversations regarding consent to treatment. So although ACT is outlined in theory and in research as an attempt to kind of overlap these two spheres of decision-making and bring personal preferences, values, and goals into the treatment decision-making process, in clinical practice, ACT was often just reduced to decisions regarding resuscitation. Documentation of a DNR underpinned by the overarching power of the legal model was seen as the only way for patients to exert their autonomy in the healthcare system, both by providers and patient participants. So legalities of consent, combined with the dominant view that biomedical treatment should be pursued until the time of death, together created a really limited role for patients looking to participate in ACT, and the only method available to help them enact their autonomy was DNR documentation. So the second research question sought to understand how participants express and experience their autonomy through the process of ACT. To do this, it was first necessary to outline how people's experiences may or may not align with the way individual autonomy is enacted in the healthcare setting. And that's primarily through the practice of informed consent. This ideal of autonomy in informed consent is characterized by three requirements. So the patient has to have sufficient in information to make a decision, a range of significant options to choose from, and must make their decision voluntarily without coercion. But when I mapped the experience of autonomy of the participants onto this, there was a significant incongruence between their experiences and the traditional model. As participants highlighted the impossibility of being informed, the way that the protocolized and guideline-driven heart failure care system dictated their options, and the coercive power of death, which favored decisions to extend survival time by accepting treatment. So this highlighted a really key finding in the study, which is that agency is constrained in advanced heart failure and ACT doesn't align with the individualistic view of autonomy that it has traditionally been associated with. So to kind of expand on this idea of the impossibility of being informed, it's helpful to contrast Daniel's experience as a cardiologist with Han's experience as a patient trying to determine whether to move forward with a heart transplantation or not. Daniel describes the challenges he faces explaining prognostic curves and mortality rates to patients, and that he even struggles to teach medical residents about heart failure and experts are unable to accurately estimate prognosis for patients. At the same time, Han struggles with this uncertainty as he logically knows he is sick because he takes medication, but he says he can run around and he feels well. So he says, at least I'm not dying yet, or maybe I am dying, I don't know. These, this overall really demonstrated the impossibility of being informed in the way that patients have to make future care decisions in the dark about their current status. Secondly, heart failure treatment decisions were shaped by strict candidacy criteria. Decisions were not based on preferences or values of the patient, nor were even understood to be under the control of individual healthcare providers, but were instead framed as decisions dictated by the larger power of a neutral candidacy criteria, which dictated. Um, which deemed patients acceptable candidates or not candidates to receive various therapies. And because of the power of these guidelines, there were really limited opportunities for participants to develop autonomy competencies related to healthcare decisions and candidacy, candidacy criteria and guidelines were really viewed as the only legitimate way to address the illness. 
because of this, patients often view themselves as having a quite a passive role in healthcare decision making and having no choices. Their options were limited to accepting treatments proposed by their clinicians or refusing. However, the risks of refusing treatment often meant certain deaths. In addition to Nathan and Peter, other participants noted that even when they did not, did not wish to receive a certain therapy, um, for example, Han um, had an ICD insertion that he originally didn't want, they were told that they had to move forward with this treatment or else they could die at any time. This demonstrates how even when patients do have specific preferences in relation to treatment, they are often disregarded or rejected in favor of prolonging life at any cost. So agency is constrained when patients construct consent to treatment as their only choice, as is the case in advanced heart failure. Choosing between various medical treatments was not something that patients and families saw as within their, their domain of control. And patients described that they weren't asked about their wishes or treatment preferences. And in fact, they often didn't have specific desires or preferences for treatment, but instead they had preferences for how they would like to live the remainder of their lives. And this often involved merely trying to stay alive for their loved ones. So this last set of results demonstrates how autonomy is deeply connected to family roles and responsibilities, relationships with healthcare providers, social location, and social identities, and is influenced by dominant social discourses such as ageism, individualism, and self-management that stem from a neoliberal ideology. So these excerpts from Han, Nathan, and Sarah's interviews demonstrate how decisions were really constructed in family life and the way people made decisions was based on what was best for their family and not just for themselves. Families were expected to want to have each other around and patients were expected to want to continue living to spend more time with their family members. This experience um, of participants was very different than the atomistic viewpoint that's portrayed by traditional individualized theories of autonomy that focus on rational decisions motivated by self-interest. An example of the role of social location and social forces, age and ageism were both highly influential in ACP. So despite it being defined as something that should be relevant for all adults, there was really an underlying discourse of ageism that targeted ACP specifically at those who are older. Healthcare providers and governments want elderly people to make the right choices by completing ACP documents to reduce intensive inter interventions for these populations at the end of life. In this study, there was a sense that when patients were younger, ACP was not relevant because everything possible should be offered or they were not yet at that point to discuss ACP. If young patients did not want extensive treatment like an ICD or resuscitation, this was seen as the wrong decision by healthcare providers and was not easily accepted. Comparatively, when patients were older and had fewer responsibilities, there was a different assessment of the moral and social value of their lives and the value of keeping them alive with intensive intervention. So autonomy was shaped by relationships with family members, healthcare providers, um, and others who were powerful and deeply influential in decision-making. Secondly, factors such as age, gender, culture, as well as broader social and political forces really shape the experience of ACP. And so overall, thinking about autonomy as a relational experience that captures these factors might allow people in a variety of social locations to participate in the process, as opposed to only those who identify with a traditional individualized approach to autonomy and decision-making. So the way I really understood the benefit of case study at the end of the day was in allowing for the development of a very in-depth and holistic understanding of a small number of cases that illuminated a complex social phenomenon such as ACP, as opposed to kind of continuing to reproduce similar data focused only at the individual patient level. So just returning to the idea of a palette of methods, I really think that case study research as a research strategy can act as a canvas for researchers by providing structure and bounds and help to focus on the phenomenon of interest. But I think equally important is the medium or the theoretical framework, which shapes how you see the phenomenon and influences decisions about what to use that will best depict the phenomenon under study. And then of course, from there are decisions about which tools or methods themselves that will best serve this purpose. So I hope that I've convinced you that using case study design in conjunction with theory-driven methods can help you create a methodological masterpiece. And hopefully some of you will take the opportunity to integrate critical theory 
into a case study approach for one of your future research projects. So before I wrap up, I did just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the amazing support I received from my supervisor and committee members, um, the amazing faculty at CQ, my current supervisor at SickKids, um, and all of the financial support I received for this work. Um, and I'm eager to hear your thoughts and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tegan. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, unsharing your screen for now so that we can uh, yep. see more people. Awesome. Beautiful. So yeah, thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate it. And in particular, the clarity that you presented, the case study, um, like Brenda was speaking about before the presentation, all of my students, I really hope attended today uh, because we'll be speaking about that in more detail. And, and uh, so thank you for that. Lots of comments and questions, I'm sure. So we'll just open it up here. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll look for you and Tenzin will help find you. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, putting your camera on maybe so Tegan can see you. Also, um, questions are also welcome in the chat. So, um, and comments, of course. So um, maybe we can get things started though. Um, is Shan, is uh, Sean here today right now? He was hoping to um, make yourself. Hi, oh, Pauline, Sean, awesome. hi. Hi, Sean, thank you so much. Um, as a supervisor of Tegan, um, I was just hoping to uh, get a comment from you to sort of maybe start things off. So thanks for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thanks, Tegan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I was really caught by your discussion around the methodological decisions you had to make in order to enact case study, because I also think that, you know, if you think we're doing an interview study, arguably many of us think of those as separate cases, but I appreciated this discussion around how uh, the methodology encouraged you to think about the kind of connections and the lattices between different forms of data, the perspectives of different participants, um, and how the data is kind of interlinked. Um, I was curious to know more about um, the discussion around power. How did case study methodology illuminate power tensions, power relationships, uh, you know, kind of um, where power was uh, taken over by a certain group, uh, let go by another group? So I was wondering if you could just illuminate um, a little bit more around your use of power. For sure. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think a huge part of this and kind of one of those key pieces I see that that distinguishes um, this study maybe from a, an interview only study is that piece of document analysis and the role of that sampling those documents in terms of deciding which would be included and then incorporating them into the analysis of the cases was really one of the main ways to help me make those connections between um, the the interview level individual data and the broader some of the broader social forces. Um, and I do have a slide on document analysis. I won't pull it up, but just the idea that um, thinking about document creation and how documents aren't kind of created in a vacuum and are based on um, other documents and other forces that are happening simultaneously and being able to connect, um, especially some of the um, perspectives of healthcare providers who would have more power often in the patient provider relationship with how their actions were being dictated or guided by documents or policies or guidelines was really helpful as kind of a concrete way to see, oh, this is how they're enacting that power, or this is how a broader kind of social force is coming to play um, within the individual patient provider relationship. So I think that was kind of the key way for me to be able to, to get at that and to think critically about um, also the ways that patients were resisting some um, suggestions by their providers or resisting advanced care planning, um, which was really of interest to me because it is something that's been so heavily researched and so heavily pushed on people, but there is just this strong rejection by patients. And so I was really interested in that that piece of power as well in terms of them saying, you know, this is, this doesn't fit the way that I think about my uh, future or my care or the way I make decisions in my life. So I'm just not going to participate in this. 
and the ways that they enacted their power in that way too. Great, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? While we're waiting, um, Tegan, if I, I'm just gonna jump in here, if that's okay. I, I was particularly um, interested in your framing of triangulation, which as you know, in, in critical qualitative circles sometimes um, has been heavily critiqued. Um, so mm -hmm. I like the way that you framed it as this web of perspectives. And um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. And also, I'm, I'm curious about whether you think it translates to other methodologies, or is this kind of way that you've used triangulation particularly um, well suited to case study? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Maybe I'll answer that second part first. I think um, I, th I do think it is particularly well suited just because of the way that cases are constructed and kind of conceptualized that almost inherently allows you to bring multiple perspectives together and kind of analyze the different relationships that are happening between those pieces of, of data and those perspectives. So I do think it's well suited, although at the same time, I think that the idea behind um, kind of stakes conceptualization of triangulation could be relevant in other studies as well, where there's multiple, um, whether it's data sources or data methods, um, could be used in that way to help actually strengthen the findings. And I found that it was a really helpful way to get at that kind of nuance. Uh, the, the distinction of we're not trying to focus in and, and um, confirm that there's one experience here that is universal for everyone or one truth, but more so trying to take interest in how people understand the same experience differently and why that might be and what is kind of shaping their perspective. Um, especially in, in my case, I did have multiple interviews with multiple participants at the same time, whether it was like a patient and their loved one or patient multiple loved ones. So even that dynamic playing out in real time was really interesting to kind of capture as well. Thank you for that. Um, couple, there's a question in the uh, in the chat here, which I'll just read out, Tegan, if that's okay. Um, uh, lots of comments coming in about a great presentation. Okay. I was curious to hear more. So this is from Brianna Wadnick. Um, I was curious to hear more about how you drew from approaches from both yin and stake, um, and who seem to have different uh, paradigmatic, parad paradigmatic approaches to case study. Is it common to draw from both yin and stake's perspectives? Did you get any pushback? I'm curious about this too. Um, <laughs> on that from your advisors or reviewers? And if so, how did you justify your approach? <laughs> Well, I will just say first off, if I did get any pushback, I've probably blacked it out by now. So I might not have a fully uh, <laughs> fully accurate uh, memory of that. But I don't um, I don't remember being a lot of pushback, but more so an encouragement to be extremely thoughtful about which components are being used and why and what how that aligns with that author's or their, their paradigm that they're coming from and what impact that has on the methodology for the work that we're doing. So I did have to spend a lot of time outlining um, not only what, that, what pieces were being pulled from which authors, but also why it was justified to do so. And I hope I, I kind of gave a few examples throughout the presentation on that. Um, it's hard to answer the question about whether it's common. It is, it's definitely done. I, I, I'm not the first person to pull from both of those authors. There isn't a lot, as I mentioned, of examples of key study research in this way. So that was why it was a little bit um, kind of figuring it out as we go and developing a lot of the justification as we kind of better understood the different approaches and what they could, what they could bring. And I do think that's where having a really strong uh, theoretical and philosophical basis supported me a lot. And I don't know if I would have been able to do that without that grounding because 
that was how I was able to return to and justify the decisions I was making and how they fit and were congruent with my theoretical approach in the end. Um, so we kind of worked on that on that together. Um, and so far, I mean, the reviewers also, I didn't get, get pushback on that specific piece from. Um, so it, it is kind of, a, I, I don't think it's uncommon to pull from multiple viewpoints to kind of create something that works for you, which is kind of this flexibility hallmark of case study research, um, but it does just need to be well justified. Awesome, there's a couple of hands up, but I will, um, I'll do one more question from the chat here. So this is from Matthew. Um, I'm wondering about the ethics of how the case study is used in general in our health ecosystems. So often case studies are used as teaching tools presented at rounds used in journal articles, and the patient often doesn't even know their case is being used in this way, nor have provided consent. Perhaps you could speak to how case study as a method differs. Yeah, absolutely. I actually had this point in the talk and then I took it out. So I'm, gl I'm glad you asked. Um, this, the way that it's typically distinguished um, in the methodological literature is calling the types of cases you're referring to as case reports. Um, and that the case study as a methodology is a, a, a completely separate um, approach to a research kind of strategy or research design. Um, and I, I agree with you that um, about what you've said about these case reports. And often um, I think you could think about them as the uh, intrinsic case where they're very unique and uh, it's um, presented as kind of a description of a, maybe a unique illness or presentation of an illness that um, clinicians would like to learn from. But it's actually not uh, a demonstration of a case study because there is an interest in the context of that person, the phenomenon, that whole construction of um, social factors that go into the, the case study component, it's really focusing on that um, kind of biomedical piece of diagnosis or um, symptom presentation or something like that. So I would, I would call that a case report um, compared to a case study methodology. Great. Um, Brenda, would you mind? Uh, Brenda had her hand up, and then I'll go back to the questions um, in the chat. But <clears throat> yeah, great live too. question. Yeah, thanks, Polly um, and Tegan. Thank you for such a great and and thoughtful presentation, and thinking about all the students that are here in our forum. Um, and as you know, we're going to be talking about case study, so you've given me lots to lots to engage with, but. Uh, the question I have is maybe a simple one, and that's, did you always know that it was going to be case study? Like, I love how you pointed out at the beginning that your, your object of study was always kept in view, right? What is the phenomenon I'm interested in? And that's something I think really important, especially for new researchers to understand. But, but how did you know case study? Like, did you ever think ethnography or grounded theory and yeah, so I, I think it's helpful to think maybe a little, hear you talk a little bit about that process for you. And to me, it came up when you talked about um, documents analysis, because I was thinking at what point did you, did you decide to use that method within the case study? So it's kind of a two-part question. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great point. And I definitely didn't know from the beginning. I think a big shift for me um, was conducting that literature review and kind of seeing that really glaring gap in terms of how all the majority of the literature was really structured at this individual level. And there was kind of no, um, I was familiar already with the relational autonomy and really excited about that idea. And I just saw so much lacking from that, from that perspective in what the current literature showed. So I think working from that and trying to think about a way to include all of those levels of um, kind of relationships that, that structure and shape autonomy uh, throughout kind of someone's life or healthcare experience was really important. Um, and so I, I was thinking about kind of potentially other uh, methodologies, but the thing that excited me about case study was kind of being able to do this super focused um, study on a 
on a small number of cases, but also construct those cases based on what was being used to guide their decision making and think about their care. So um, that that flexibility, again, I guess, coming back in terms of um, being able to sample those different types of documents that were really shaping the information they were being presented in clinic or um, was really shaping the way healthcare providers were being taught about this practice or thinking about informed consent and um, capturing all of that while still keeping the focus on um, this idea of autonomy as something that somehow resides within the individual but is enacted through relationship. So that was how we kind of through discussion came to came to think about and ultimately land on case study in comparison to some of those other um, other methodologies, which I think would have been interesting, but might it, the phenomenon of interest might be a little bit different or might shift a little bit if you're thinking about something like an ethnography compared to a case study. And then I know you had a question about document analysis, and I, I don't I don't know if I already if I got to it already. I I, yeah, okay. yeah, that question was more at what point did you decide? So have you already set up the entire study that that each case would have these different features and these different methods, or was it at some point you realized there was a document that needed to be incorporated and so there was some kind of emergent quality to when you made those decisions around your, your actual methods within that methodology? I think, so the, the idea of including documents was there from the beginning, just because this is such a practice that is bounded in legalities and um, documentation of consent and uh, decision making that is so gray but also very black and white with kind of paperwork and legal documents so I knew from the beginning that I wanted to find a way to incorporate those types of things um, because I felt that connection between the documents and all these studies on patient experience or patient reported you know survey measures of understanding ACT was really lacking um, but in terms of the specific decisions about it um, we, I would kind of decide based on what was happening in that case, which, what to sample in terms of the document and, and constructing that case. Um, and most of the time it came more so through how healthcare providers were talking about their practice or what, um, how they understood ACT in the context of that patient situation, um, which led to kind of pulling the informed consent policy for that hospital, for example, and including that in the analysis of the findings. So that was kind of how it went iteratively. And then once I had kind of done that, I wasn't I, I wasn't going and pulling another informed consent from it. I would try to do a little bit of variation in terms of that piece. And then there's um, more kind of patient facing advanced care planning, educational materials that were pulled into another case based on what they were discussing. So that was kind of how we um, did it on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Tegan. That's, a, that's great. Uh, Joan, I see you have your hand up. If you wouldn't mind waiting, um, I'll just take one more question from the chat so I don't lose because there's a whole bunch of things and then, and then we'll go to Joan Egan. We can't like not ask her to wait <laughs> here. Um, so there's there's a few questions about uh, like sort of more practical. So uh, let's see. Um, Kelly Gregory says, Tegan, a uh, super interesting study. She loves that you incorporated patient family members in your interviews, um, very coherent with feminist relational values. How did you decide to stop collecting data or how did you stop collecting data as relations can go on and on? I also feel like with, with my experience with older adults too, those interviews can be kind of epic. So mm. um, I'm, I also am curious about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, we that I think also is where keeping that focus on the phenomenon of interest was really beneficial and binding the case. So at some point, the the people being um, recruited had to have some connection to that phenomenon of interest, based on how the patient was was describing their experiences. So um, if they, I just remember one of the cases. Um, interviewed him with his daughter, but of course he spoke a lot about his wife's role in their decision making. And so we then had a conversation with her um, and they kind of alluded to their other child, but um, it was clear that he 
was one that was not interested at all in being part of those kinds of conversations and was not a healthcare person like some of the other family members and um, really wanted a firm boundary between being involved in some of those um, conversations. And so that was kind of a line where we didn't ask to include him in the study as well. We, we were kind of guided based on the patient themselves starting at that individual level and how they talked about their experiences of decision making and who was involved in those decisions and how um, they worked through that process. And as much as possible, trying to go back to the source of, you know, if they referred to meeting with a social worker, for example, to talk about what it might mean to get a transplantation, then we would go to the social worker and develop, a, 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 you know, try to recruit them for an interview and discuss from there. So I think it was kind of starting at that, that individual level of the patient and what was relevant to them and then keeping that framework of uh, you know, the ACP experience as the phenomenon of interest and being guided by that in terms of how we made decisions about who to go to next. Makes sense. Thanks, Deegan. Well, as you were uh, honorable mention for the Joan Eakin Award for Methodological Excellence in a Qualitative Doctoral Dissertation, talk about a mouthful there too. Um, and Joan <laughs> Eakin is here and has her hand up. I would like to call on her. Hi, Joan. Hi there. Sorry, I didn't really get my hand up. I, I've been looking for the hand up button, but couldn't find it the whole time. Anyway, um, Tegan, thank you for your presentation. I was, I was really drawn to your topic because I've always tried to figure out what is a case study. Um, I, I, I actually don't know what a case study is, so I was, I was, um, I was really interested in the fact that you, you've called this a case study and that you're talking about, you talk about designing the case and you talk about um, uh, binding the case, but you, you didn't talk, at least I didn't hear it. You're talking about what is a case. I know you put up what the, what the literature says and so on, but I, I didn't find that super useful because it seems to me that, well, your case are people. And I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how you got to that as the case, as opposed to all the other things that I always had the impression were potential candidates for being a case like institutions or a setting or a particular mm. milieu or uh, an institutional arrangement or something else besides people. And you, you ended up with having people as your cases. And I wondered if you could comment on when you decided that, did you go into the project knowing that those are your cases? Because so often when you talk about the unit of analysis, like you, you don't, in qualitative research, you so often, you mostly don't really know what your unit of analysis is until you get in there. You, you just know kind of a general feel, feel and sense of what you're doing, but you don't have the unit of analysis pinned down. That's the point of doing qualitative research. So perhaps you could tell me a little bit about how you landed on people as your case and what possibly, especially having done it now, might have been alternative cases for this, the kinds of things you wanted to find out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great question. And I think you're, you're absolutely right because of the kind of wide range of how case study is used, it often is at that even program level or business level or some kind of organizational level that we think of looking at a case. But I, I think the kind of thinking behind it still is true for bringing it down to the person level in terms of thinking about how those different factors combine to create that person's experience of autonomy or decision-making. Um, and I didn't know for sure like you said, how exactly the cases were going to be constructed or at how big they might get to. And, and actually the institutional level played a really important role in being able to include pieces from the institution to help me understand how these practices were kind of being brought into clinical life and enacted in kind of reality there. Um, but it, it's a good, it's a good point. I think I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would say my cases were people, but I was trying to 
develop a case of advanced care planning or what it meant to be participating in decision making in this type of advanced unpredictable chronic disease state and what contributes to that experience. And so there is some individual person level data, but I think that's also why thinking about the role of the relationships at the interpersonal level and then broader was really helpful to understand what constructed that experience of trying to make decisions and what framed the rhetoric around how people understood trying to make decisions for the future for themselves or trying to speak to family about these topics that were kind of abstract and hard to really um, kind of get at what the ultimate goal of this advanced care planning really was for people. So, um, so that's kind of more how I thought about it as opposed to um, people as cases really trying to describe that experience of participating in ACP because that was what I found was lacking from the literature. And so that was really where I started was I didn't see a holistic description of that experience in the literature. It was just constantly survey surveys saying people don't do this and then an intervention study with a with a intervention of focus and individual autonomy saying this is what you should do just tell us what you want in this format and it used to be paper but now we're putting it on a website or now we're putting it on an app and just tell us what you want and things will get better and there was no really kind of holistic analysis of like why is this important how is it being messaged to people how are people understanding their role in decision making do they have any opportunity to participate in decision making before this point in their healthcare trajectory, which most of the time they don't. So they have no experience being asked what they want or what is important to them prior to this. And so they're very confused and not sure what to do with that type of request. Um, and so that's more kind of how I was trying to frame it was how is this experience shaped and what's influencing the way that it's thought about and discussed. You know, I, Keegan, I. Uh, Polly, can I just add one little thing here? Um, I, I totally get what you did and where you ended up. And I mean, it's a really significant contribution to, to, um, to, to research in, in this area. Um, but what I, what, I, what I was thinking of as you were talking and as, even now as you're talking, I can't help but wonder if calling it a case study or a case methodology is, might be, uh, it might have its downsides when you're operating in a health um, sciences context, which so many of us are, because everybody mm -hmm. thinks they know what a case study is. And the fact that you end up focusing on people is just totally consistent with, um, with the notion that the case is the, the body there or the person. When in, in fact, you've gone way, be, I mean, your whole, you started off uh, theoretically saying it's not about you know, it's not just about personal individual things that you're bringing in the broader contextual discursive environment, et cetera. Um, but that isn't captured by what a lot of people think of as case methodology. Um, yeah. I, I would love to see you uh, in, invent your, your own name to characterize your methodology because it, the, the methodology that you used is used by, by a lot of us, elements of it. Uh, you know, and I'm trying to get a sense for what saying it's a case methodology adds to the to the individual methodological elements that you you used, and and just to alert you to just the idea that perhaps you do your work, uh, it, you you actually limit a little bit some of your methodological potential by calling it a traditional name. In fact, you've taken it way beyond, in my view. Um, the, the idea of 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 case. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I really I really enjoyed it. It was very thoughtful and made me think a lot. So thank you, Tegan. No, thank you for the comments. I appreciate it, and I think it, I think you get back to what I think someone had written in the chat about how this is different than the case studies that are presented on rounds at the hospital and um, the things that we're all familiar with as clinicians in terms of this presentation of this disease as a case study or a case report um, and. Yeah, I kind of, I, I feel two ways about it. I totally agree with what you're saying and, and recognize some of the limitations that might be there with that um, kind of broader understanding of the typical 
thing that people think of when they think of a case study. Um, I, and as I mentioned, I have seen it suggested in the literature that these would actually be classified as case reports and not a case study because there isn't that methodology and focus on the phenomenon of interest or the context, which is what is so crucial about case is capturing context. Um, and that's not what the what is of interest in a case report. It's really look at this presentation of a disease versus what's the context of the situation that's happening here is where I really see the distinction between the two. Um, and on the flip side, I kind of want to argue for people to be more well known about the opportunity for case study as a methodology, as a research, as opposed to not a case report, but what this could mean for us as uh, researchers, clinicians in the healthcare system, and um, the opportunities that might be there to, to think about this in a way that could capture the complexities of our healthcare system. And like I said, the failures and the successes and the good and bad practices and the things that, you know, make pragmatic research really relevant right now to kind of highlight some of those, those things. So I'm kind of on both sides of that, of that. <laughs> Thank you, Tegan, for the answer, and Joan for the zinger, as usual. Awesome. Uh, there's a question in the chat about um, uh, somebody, Amy's asking a little bit more about sharing how you sampled cases. Did you plan to have seven cases at the outset? Did you purposefully th theoretically sample as you analyzed the data? How did that work? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you nailed it. We were really focused on theoretical sampling and be, as we were informed by this um, relational conception of autonomy, trying to feel like we had relevant data to be able to speak to that experience. Um, so no, I had no idea how many cases there would be at the outset. Um, I didn't know how many interviews there would be, how much of anything there would be. <laughs> so it was really uh, a, an iterative kind of ongoing process of um, developing kind of, as I mentioned, each case as its own unit and trying to understand what that brought. Um, and then definitely purposely um, sampling from there, something that would add, as opposed to not trying to recreate the same case over and over, or similar cases, but trying to um, go for that diversity of participants, people, and not, of course, only in the usual demographics that we think of, of, you know, gender, ethnicity, but people that really were at different stages of disease or that really had different living arrangements. I was trying to make sure not everyone had a really um, standard kind of caregiver set up relationship. So there was one older woman who lived in assisted living, um, no family members left, for example. And so what does her relational autonomy look like and decision-making process look like in comparison to someone who might have a lot of input from family or a lot of family involvement in decision-making? So that was really purposeful. And kind of as we went, we developed those, those cases. Great, thank you. Another sort of practical question um, about recruitment. We know that recruitment is challenging. Um, you collected data from people related to a patient. Um, this is from Momtas. Um, I'm wondering how has been your experience in recruiting all these people, I guess, who are related in this group. And I think because there's a number of students um, also, and all of us who have also challenges related, maybe if you've got any tips um, around recruitment, that would be great. For sure, yeah. I know that's the kind of ongoing, always, always the challenge. Um, and I, I would have to say, I think my background um, as a nurse in this area and my comfort with the population helped with this a lot. And also, um, and also the kind of the approach that we were taking. So we were really starting with that patient and going based on who was really relevant to them. And so often in those, those interviews, they would discuss their decision making and who was involved. Um, and I would kind of explore from there. Well, do you think, you know, at the end of the interview, would that person be interested in speaking with me at all? Would, do you think maybe both of you would like to speak with me next time you're in for an appointment? Um, and we did things like that where I met with the patient once and then I met with the patient and uh, his wife for, uh, for a second interview together the next time. And so that's kind of how I tended to approach it. So really kind of making sure they felt like it was in their control and giving them that opportunity to maybe speak with that person first and then and then getting connected um, um, that way in terms of like the logistics of actually setting up an interview. Um, so that that tended to to work in this case, but um, 
it, I, I think it, yeah, it all can, can really depend. And I don't think there's one kind of black or white answer for how to make sure you get recruitment, but it is kind of an ongoing process. Thank you, Tegan. Uh, we've, Brenda's got her hand up again. Um, so we'll call on Brenda. And uh, before we think we've got just a few minutes before we end today. Thanks, Go ahead, Pauline. Brenda. Thanks, Pauline. And thanks for the extra time. You know what, Tegan, I wanted to say this to you earlier. I'm having some problems with my speakers and they seem to be gentle right now. So now I can talk again. But uh, listening to your response to Sean about the question of power and how your case study helped you, you know, think about that concept, which is so important to critical work. Thinking about your response to Joan and your insistence that there's something to this thing called case study as a methodology. And especially, and I've been especially appreciative when I looked at your title that you took care to say critical qualitative um, case study, which as you say is a mouthful, but an important mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I love your passion for holding on to the possibility of this as a methodology, because when you think about ethnography, I mean, we have every kind of ethnography now, right? We have critical ethnography, autoethnography, institutional ethnography. So all of these sorts of methodologies and how they morph and change and get shaped by the people who use them and do them, which I think is partly what Joan may have been getting at in terms of, you know, your own contribution to this and naming it in a particular way, which may be a bit down the road for you, but my observation is, and maybe you've done this, have you published this work methodologically, not substantively, right? Because that's often hard for students to do, right? When they're trying to get jobs and out on the market. And at CQ, we try to encourage that because, you know, my students on the call here may want to use case study and they'll be in the same position you were, that there's not much yeah. published on this, right? Yeah. So where are yeah. you with yeah. that? Where are you with that? <laughs> yeah, no pressure, Brenda. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't say that the uh, two years of pandemic have been kind to me in that way. So yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have this published. I actually don't have the even the substantive results um, published yet, which I'm working on. So yeah. I am aware that I need to do that. And actually, that was kind of our conversation with Polly in advance was hopefully this would give me the little kick that I need to um, maybe inspire me to get going on that and, and get it out there because I do I definitely understand the, the need and from a student perspective as, as well like any additional guidance is so helpful so I, I get it that's great you've got it all there so just a word of encouragement I think okay well maybe I'll send you a draft to read then <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> the challenge is on <laughs> yeah. great. thank you very much Tegan thanks Brenda Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Tegan. Thanks for everybody for coming today. What an exceptional presentation and such a great turnout for the Friday of a long weekend. Um, some A super good discussion, lots of comments in the chat, Tegan, which I encourage you to take a look at. People really responding to um, your presentation and um, really positive ways. Um, just before we end, I want to ask everyone to put November 8th in their calendar for our next speaker in the CQ series for this year. It's uh, Leticia Robes, who is going to be presenting on utopians of writing qualitatively by a Mexican researcher. So um, sure to be a good time and a methodological adventure um, as these seminar series are. But uh, we'll just end today saying thanks again, Tegan. I don't know if you have, want to say anything before we sign off here, but it's just been a pleasure and we really um, are grateful because we know these things take a lot of time and energy to put together. So thank you. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity and, and definitely the, the encouragement to keep going with this and get it out there. So thanks everyone for engaging and all your questions and uh, to Brenda and Polly for the support in getting this going and really nice to see you, Sean and Joan as well. So I'll just say, I'll end it there. Thank you so much. <laughs>